Thanks for joining us today for Jennifer Schaus and Associates in our Webinar Wednesday program. We're coming to you live from Washington, D.C. Our webinars are every Wednesday and are provided complimentary. They're recorded and can be downloaded from our website and YouTube channel, which now holds over 300 of our government contracting webinars. In the interest of time, we do not take questions, so if you have questions for our speaker, we will have more information on the last slide of the presentation today. A special thanks to our educational sponsor, the National Veterans Small Business Coalition, for making these webinars possible. The NBSBC is the largest nonprofit trade association for veterans. Please visit their website for more information. And now a little bit about us. We work with U.S. federal government contractors, including product, service, and software firms. Our services range from market analysis reports to contract vehicles and compliance. For more information, please go to our website. We also have opportunities for your organization to advertise in our newsletter. We now reach over 17,000 subscribers, and this includes both contractors and government. Contact us for more for pricing information with the email shown on your screen. And now to introduce our speaker, Mary Beth Bosco. Welcome, Mary Beth. We're glad to have you here with us today, and I'll turn the floor over to you. Sure. Thank you very much, Colton. Um, I'm going to be speaking today about bid protest strategies. So we'll start with a very quick review of bid protest procedures and then get into the more strategic choices such as should you file a protest, um, what information can I gather, the all important in which, in which forum should I file, um, and then you know what does a win look like and some alternative strategies. If you could uh, advance to the next slide. So in terms of bid protest procedures, um, the, um, a bid protest can be pre-award or post-award. A pre-award protest is typically one that challenges the terms of the solicitation, that it's unduly restrictive, um, or that it's contradictory. A post-award protest challenges the award, obviously, itself, and it is basically it's, you know, it's brought by a disappointed offeror. Now, uh, a disappointed offeror still has to qualify as an interested party, and that means they um, must suffer press, they must have suffered prejudice but by the agency's action. And for example, if um, you file a protest and that you are the fourth in line for award, even if you won um, the protest, you would still not be in line for award. So you don't really have any prejudice. And um, in most cases, the protest will be dismissed. We'll get into this. Um, in more detail, but there are basically three possible places that you can bring a protest. One is to the agency, one is to GAO, and the third is to the Court of Federal Claims. And as always, deadlines are key because if you meet certain deadlines, you can actually stop performance of the contract um, and get a stay of the award or a stay of performance. So the most important ones, the basic ones, are if you want to protest the terms of the solicitation, you must do it before the closing date of solicitation. If you want to protest an award, the typical process is you must ask for a debriefing within three days of getting the notice of the award, and then you have five days after that to bring your protest in order to get the what we call the SICA or Competition and Contracting Act stay. You can also uh, file if you're 10 days within the award, even without a debriefing, you would get the SICA stay. Uh, next, please, next slide. Um, really, the first thing you need to do um, when you're thinking about a protest is get that debriefing. Um, you must have a debriefing in most uh, procurements. The only exceptions are in federal supply service procurements and in um, simplified acquisition. Uh, the Department of Defense now has an enhanced debriefing process, 
uh, applies just for DOD contracts. And what that does is give the protester a chance to ask more questions after the debriefing so that, you know, they can, you know, you get debriefed, you get to, you know, go back to the office, think about what you just heard, and ask any additional questions. A debriefing can be in person, on the phone, or in writing. One question we get a lot is, should an awardee request a debriefing? Obviously, you're not going to file a protest. Um, so it wouldn't be for that purpose. And we generally say, yeah, if it's a good idea, because you can always make a proposal stronger, and you might get some um, information from the agency that would make um, you know, your next next proposal, um, an even better proposal. Next slide. What you are supposed to get in a debriefing is a brief explanation of the basis for award. They will, the agency will identify the weaknesses and deficiency in your proposal. Uh, the agency is supposed to give you the overall evaluated cost and technical rating of the awardee and of your company, as well as the overall ranking of, of all of the offers. It's important to know that because, um, you know, sometimes the agency will not um, volunteer that information. Uh, next slide, please. So, you basically, you've gotten your information from a debriefing, and the next question is, okay, now I know, what happens, should I file a protest or not? Um, and, and, you know, many companies are reluctant to file a protest because um, they are reluctant to anger or annoy their customers. I think in most cases, the agencies um, take protests in stride as a basically ordinary course of business. Uh, unless this is a company that protests all the time or if the protest obviously uh, is not based on solid grounds. Um, the best protest grounds or the easiest ones to prevail on are the ones that catch the agency in a procedural error, such as um, the agency held discussions with one offeror but not with others. The agency gave more information to one offeror, but not the others. The agency failed to actually evaluate mandatory criteria. Those are, like I said, those are the ones that are um, much easier to prevail on. Um, challenges to an agency's uh, technical decision or um, price evaluation are harder because GAO and the court usually vest great discretion in the agencies on the grounds that they um, have the technical and the cost um, expertise. It's certainly not impossible to win those, but it's just a little bit more difficult, I think. One option that we present our, our, our clients, if you've got a colorable reason for protest, you should go ahead and file. And then under uh, GAO's bid protest process, at least, the agency has to file what's called an agency report, which will consist of um, basically a legal brief and then the documents on which the agency relied to make the protest, I mean, to make the award decision. Sometimes uh, we'll evaluate that uh, record and go back to the client and say, hey, you know what? Um, the record is really good to the agency, and we don't recommend um, going forward with the protest. So you can always withdraw the protest at that point, and I think an agency uh, will appreciate that action on the part of the protester. I say we look at the agency report because, as you probably know, um, protective orders are issued in GAO and Court of Federal Claims protests. Um, the idea is that the um, bidders themselves should not have access 
to cost information, technical information, or evaluation information in case the protest prevails and there's another competition. You want to keep that competitive information away from the bidders themselves. So typically only outside counsel or consultants can be um, admitted to the protective order. They're the only ones who can view most of the documents in that um, administrative record. Um, and they uh, have to be careful about what they communicate to the company about what's in the record because they have to make sure they're not um, communicating any protected material. Next slide, please. Uh, clients also ask, hey, I mean, Woody, should I intervene in a big protest? And our answer to that is usually yes. Um, you will therefore have access, access, your counsel will have access to all the agency pleadings and what the protester says. Um, so you can monitor the protest that way. Or you can be more active and file briefs. Um, uh, and also they, you know, talk to the agency, perhaps help the agency in formulating the defense of the award. So we think that's generally a good idea, and if all you do is intervene and monitor, it's not a very costly uh, option. Next slide, please. So the next question is, where do we file this protest? And that's where a lot of the strategy comes into play. The first place that you can file a protest is with the agency that issued the award of the solicitation itself. Importantly, if you fall within the deadlines, you will get that automatic stay. Uh, so that's a, a big um, plus. For agency protests. The downside is that you never get access to agency documents. Basically, you file a written protest and then the agency has 35 days to respond to the protest. There's no interaction, there's no discussions, you just get a written decision. And that written decision is either going to be the contracting off by the contracting officer who made the award decision. Um, or you can ask for a protest to be reviewed by a level above the contracting officer. I think that agency level protests are really only of use in a pre-award situation where you are saying to the agency, there's a, you know, there's a big issue here and you're basically giving the agency the chance to correct uh, their their own um, mistake and maybe correct the solicitation without subjecting them to a GAO protest. GAO protests are by far the most common of the protest forums. Um, you do get that automatic stay and you also get access to documents. So you will be getting, um, like I said, this agency report and then you, uh, your team, has 10 days to respond to the agency report. In many cases, the GAO attorney will then ask specific questions or convene conference calls um, to get more information from the protester and the government. Very, very rarely will there be a hearing, an actual hearing, uh, typically, that only occurs when there is a, a, a technical issue involved that's very complex. Do you get an independent decision maker? The answer to that is yes. It will be a GAO attorney who will conduct uh, the protest proceedings and give you your um, response. The GAO must come out with a decision within 100 days of filing the protest. Those are business days, so it winds up being about a three-month period before you get a decision. Next slide, please. The Court of Federal Claims is becoming a more popular forum for protests. The 
big difference is that you do not get that automatic competition and contracting stay if you file at COPSI, as we call it. You have to instead file for either a temporary restraining order or a preliminary injunction in order to stop award of the contract or stop performance of the contract if the court grants your motion. Um, it is a somewhat similar proceeding to GAO um, under different terminology. The agency typically files, again, the administrative record, which is the same as the agency record at GAO. And then, you know, the protester files a brief. Uh, the agency files uh, a response brief. Um, and most often there is a hearing before the judge, although it's relatively rare to have um, witnesses at that hearing. More often it's an oral argument between the attorneys. It is um, an Article One judge who makes the decision, so you are getting an independent um, person to make the decision. The other thing that I think is good about this is that um, in, addition to, in addition to agency counsel, you will also have an attorney from the Department of Justice who will be running the government defense, and that person is usually uh, less invested in the award than the agency and is um, maybe a little bit more um, susceptible to settlement. This process takes longer than GAO. Three to six months is about the um, about the typical or average duration of a COPSI protest. Um, and the downside is probably this is the most expensive. Uh, next slide, please. Wanted to protect. These are GAO statistics. I wanted to point one thing out. Um, the sustain rate, that is when GAO actually renders a decision, those rates are pretty low, as you can see on this slide, 15% in 2018, 13% in 2019. But the effectiveness rates are much higher at 44% for both years. What that means is that the um, agency to, takes corrective action in those um, in those instances to bring that average up. Um, now, this is where another uh, strategy comes into mind as you're thinking about filing a protest, and that is even if the agency takes corrective action, did you win? In other words, um, would you? Uh, let's say the GAO or the court says, "Hey, you know what?" Uh, the agency messed up the technical evaluation. Um, I'm recommending that the agency redo the technical evaluation or asks for another round of proposals uh, or opens up the competition again. Um, at the end of the day, after all that happens, you might still lose because the agency may just come back and award to the original awardee. So it's hard to predict that. But if you've got a good sense of where you stand with your agency, uh, that's probably helpful. Um, next slide, please. GAO puts out statistics every year, and they'll say that the top rate, they say the top reasons for sustaining protests are the unreasonable technical evaluation. You'll also see the unequal treatment, inadequate uh, documentation. Um, uh, rationales, which again, I think are probably the easiest to win. Um, you will also see a GAO now a trend to uh, give the agencies multiple chances to explain their award decision. So after the um, basic um, comments, your comments have been submitted, the GAO may come back to the agency several times and ask them to explain things. That draws out the cost of the protest and sometimes is a factor, anticipating that might be a factor militating against the award, I mean, the, the uh, bringing a protest. 
um, other alternatives to protest. Um, if you don't want to bring a protest, but you have some grievances, um, you might want to meet with the agency. Um, they will, uh, I think, appreciate your fo foregoing um, a protest, and you just might get some good information out of them. Um, you can also approach the awardee and see if there's any uh, work that they um, might have for your company. And with that, I will uh, close this webinar and thank everyone for um, listening and hope everyone is well. Uh, back to you, Colton. Thank you, Mary Beth, for a great presentation and sharing your time with us. And uh, thanks to everyone who joined us. The recording will be on our website and YouTube channel within the next 24 hours. Please join us this Friday as we cover each part of the FAR and join us next Wednesday for more hot topics in federal contracting.